Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Gaming Tentacom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with discussion on the GPU market and cryptocurrencies. With the last quarter, AMD saw a rise in sales of its graphics cards, which does seem like a good thing, right? Unfortunately, this enthusiasm has been somewhat tempered with the company's over-reliance on the cryptographic market, so we'll discuss that in just a second. Then we'll move over to Intel and the launch of the Stratix 10TX, which is an impressive demonstration of Intel's eNIP technologies. Then we'll go over some of the details of the Snapdragon 700 series, which looks impressive compared to the 600 series, particularly in power efficiency, and sees some gains of up to two times in the performance stakes. And then we'll finish the video discussing SD cards. SD cards? Really? I hear you scream. Yes, indeed. Western Digital have demoed an SD card with a PCIe interface, and it reads at 880 megabytes per second. That's pretty damn tasty. But we'll start things out, as I said, with the GPU market. So, according to John Peddy's research, we have a startling realisation that over 3 million graphics cards were sold to miners during 2017. And these graphics cards bought in 776 million US dollars. Unsurprisingly, the largest company which benefited from this is AMD. Needless to say, this did somewhat impact market share, with Nvidia's total market share declining in comparison to AMD. And obviously, this is simply because of the sheer number of cards that AMD shifted to mining. So on John Peddy's website, you can see that AMD have 33.7% of market share this quarter, and Nvidia have the remainder of 663 This, of course, refers to discrete graphics card deals only. We're not talking about integrated GPUs. Unfortunately, while that's great for AMD in the short term, there are a couple of issues. The first issue is it's actually annoying gamers, and gamers are going to be the folks who stick with you in the long term. If the bubble bursts, well, gamers would still be buying things, even if the mining rush just dried up. And in fact, AMD commented on this. This was in a recent SEC filing. AMD said, and I quote, our GPU revenue has been driven in part due to increased interest in cryptocurrency mining. The cryptocurrency market is unstable and demand could change very quickly. For example, China and South Korea have recently instituted restrictions on cryptocurrency trading. If we are able to manage the risks related to a decrease in demand for cryptocurrency mining, our GPU market could be materially adversely affected. Sorry, if we are unable to manage. AMD also continue in the filing Intel could take action that places our discrete GPUs and IGP chipsets at a competitive disadvantage such as giving one or more of our competitors in the graphics card market, such as NVIDIA Corporation, preferential access to proprietary graphics interfaces or other useful information. Also, Intel recently announced that it's developing its own high-end discrete GPUs, end quote. According to Dr. John Petty himself, who is the president of John Petty Research, gaming has been and will continue to be the primary driver for GPU sales, augmented by the demand of cryptocurrency miners. We expect demand to slacken for miners as margins drop in response to increasing utility costs and supplies and demand forces that drive up AIB prices. Gamers can offset those costs by mining when not gaming, but prices will not drop in the near future. What does all of this mean? Well, it's kind of hard to actually know where the market is going to go. People have been predicting that cryptocurrencies are not going to be a thing or have going to crash by now, and they're simply not. On the other hand, there are certainly challenges which are popping up with cryptocurrencies. In fact, even Bill Gates has recently weighed in and said that he doesn't particularly like them. And recently, during an Ask Me Anything on Reddit, Mr. Bill Gates was asked his opinion on cryptocurrencies. Uh, among other things, he said, and I quote, the government's ability to find money laundering and tax evasion and terrorist funding is a good thing. Right now, cryptocurrencies are being used to buy fentanyl and other drugs, so it's a rare technology that has caused death in a fairly direct way. And in response 
To the future of cryptocurrency, he said speculative wave around ICOs and cryptocurrencies is super risky for those who go long. In other words, for the long-term future. Swinging things back round to AMD and NVIDIA, well, we've heard the rumours, of course, that NVIDIA are going to be releasing two separate lines of graphics cards this year. One, of course, focused at gaming, one, of course, focused at mining, whether that turns into truth or whether that's just one of those rumours that just never really materialised. Well, we'll have to wait and see. But if it is true, AMD are certainly going to get a bit of a kicking. Even if it isn't true, just for a moment, the fact of the matter is that AMD do need to get into the gaming side of things again, because once again, A, it's a very lucrative market, and B, if cryptocurrencies do fail, or at least become less profitable, and that might happen, obviously, as things become harder to mine, you require more GPU power. So there are folks out there, perhaps, who have invested in two, three, four graphics cards, because especially if they live in a fairly cheap area, in terms of utilities anyway, then they can make some decent, decent profits, for example. But that will start to change as, once again, it becomes harder to mine things. Of course, in theory, other currencies could pop up, but AMD cannot, as a business, rely on that from the GPU side. So really, for AMD, we'll have to wait to see what 7NM brings, with Vega, of course, and we'll have to wait to see what they can counter on the desktop side for us gamers. Now let's move over to Intel and the launch of the Stratix 10 TX. I find this rather interesting for a couple of reasons. One, its inclusion of high bandwidth memory too. And the second is that now it's obvious that Intel are really hitting its stride when it comes to EMIB. So I guess the headline, if this was an article, would be that Intel's shipping of this is very impressive for a couple of reasons in terms of the performance side of things. One is it doubles the bandwidth performance compared to earlier versions of the technology. And it also is the first Field Programmable Gatorade, FPGA, in the industry which operates at 58 GBS. And according to Jordan Inkles, who is Intel's Director of Marketing, over at the high-end products of Intel's Programmable Solutions Group, previously the fastest FPGAs from on the market from us in the competition operated at 28 or 30 gigabits second and the new Stratix 10 TX FPGA doubles that to 58. So this chip family is actually aimed at massive te telecommunications companies uh, for their equipment, cloud providers, as well as high-end enterprise data centers. I think you can probably guess what I mean by that. In other words, folks who need a ridiculous amount of communications bandwidth. To that end, it provides 144 uh, transceiver lanes, and this can happen with a serial data rates of between 1 and 58 gigabits per second. Inkles continued, what this really does is enable next generation of infrastructure in the marketplace, really multi-terabyte routers and network infrastructure all the way to the, five, to the full 5G backbone. Without this type of technology, you could take a 5G cell phone call, but you couldn't really send it off over the backbone infrastructure. And there are multiple different types of these Stratix 10 FPGAs, uh, which are currently available. This includes the GX FPGA, and that's with a 28G receiver, um, the SX FPGA with an embedded quad-core ARM processor, and also the uh, Stratix 10 MX FPGA with high bandwidth memory. And as I mentioned at the very start of this, it really leverages uh, EMIB to allow Intel to create these type of products. And with some of these products, you can have up to six different chiplets on the same package. Now, compare that to what you might see in the customer-facing side of the market from Intel, and it's, well, it dwarfs it. A single EMIB type of implementation, excuse me, is what Intel are offering, like, you know, us, retail customers, compare to this. And what's really cool about this, simply because of how it's produced, while the actual central FPGA is built on the 14NM process technology by Intel, the transceivers themselves were built upon TSMC's 16FF process. The bottom line, for next generation network technology, for faster connections, for cloud computing, for servers, for an increasingly mobile world, for an increasingly data-driven world, at the end of the day, these are the types of things which provide the backbone for that. 
So while, of course, you at your home might be using, you know, whatever ISP running at, you know, let's say a 200 megabyte, uh, megabit per second connection, perhaps 300 or what have you, that's still data that needs to go somewhere. And so, in this instance, I think Intel's decision to acquire the company which were Altera for 16.7 billion, who were, of course, the company who are responsible for the FPGA, which is at the heart of this thing, I think Intel made a pretty damn good decision. Next up is the Snapdragon 700 series, which, of course, is by Qualcomm. Now I'm going to shock you to the very foundations of your being here, because this is essentially a product which sits between the premium product that is the Snapdragon 800 series and the high-end, or current high-end, Snapdragon 600 processors. While there's not been a specific product catalog uh, so far released by Qualcomm, so we can't say it's got X number of um, cores and X clock speeds, that type of thing, they have released some generic information, and it's still fairly impressive. So in terms of performance, the Snapdragon 700 series processors will be up to 30% more power efficient. Camera functionality has also been improved as well. We see the Qualcomm Spectra ISP leveraged, which will allow advanced photo functionality. So we'll see it inherently being able to do things like slow motion shooting, connectivity, improvements in carrier Wi-Fi uh, features. We see an enhanced Bluetooth 5 support added. And in terms of AI, according to Qualcomm, its AI engine can offer twice the on-device AI performance compared to the Snapdragon 660. So when will products which actually use these uh, chips start making their way to the store shelves? Well, the commercial samples are going to hit in the first half of this year, so it's going to be about perhaps three to six months after that, so let's say the second half of 2018, possibly the early part of 2019, that we really start to see phones and other devices use these things. And I'm going to leave you with a brief summary from Qualcomm. The new Qualcomm Snapdragon 700 mobile platform series is designed to exceed what is expected from today's high-tier mobile experiences, with features and performance previously only available on the premium Snapdragon 800 mobile platform series. So once again, this isn't quite premium. It's not quite in the realms of like a $1,000 smartphone type of performance, but it still will be very impressive indeed and will probably offer the sweet spot for many customers. And here's something I didn't expect to cover for the longest time. A SD card with a PCI interface. Now, Western Digital have demonstrated an experimental, I just want to stress that experimental SD card, and it features a PCIe Generation 3 interface running at times one speeds. And in conjunction with this, the SD Card Association is actually calling upon the industry itself to adopt PCIe as a standard interface. So Western Digital actually demonstrated this on a system featuring an M2 to SD adapter. And the SD Card, uh, according to Western Digital, operates at 880 megabytes per second sequential read speeds and up to 430 megabytes per second sequential write speed. And they were testing this on Crystal Disk Mark. So that's pretty impressive for it to be achievable in real life. Western Digital, in its efforts to work alongside the SD Card Association, does tell us that the actual implementation costs of the PCIe interface is not that expensive. And so it possibly won't be a prohibitive factor if the industry did decide to adopt this. I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if this did have a certain market. In fact, removable storage solutions like this, particularly with certain test rigs or developmental environments, that type of thing, I could certainly see it being very popular. After all, it means that you're going to have much faster connections than, let's say, SATA, but you're essentially just unplugging that SD card, which means it's pretty much the easiest thing in the world to remove. Obviously, as PCIe speeds become faster, so PCIe 3 uh, migrates to PCIe 4, PCIe 5, then they will also um, support those in kind. 
So since existing SD slash PCIe cards use UHS 2 slash 3 pins, there should be some standardization options available that would allow backwards compatibility. And from what we can tell, that's exactly the method that Western Digital used here. And obviously backwards compatibility is well kind of important given the sheer number of devices which are currently available. Imagine, for example, if you just bought your new shiny camera or a mobile phone or whatever, and then, well, there were issues and things started to migrate. So obviously there has to be backwards compatibility taken into account. But on top of that as well, the industry will, if enough folks support it, and by folks, of course, we mean here companies, the industry will eventually move in that direction. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.